Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome uh, to this virtual event, Conflict in Context, War in Ukraine, held in partnership with the World Affairs Council of Atlanta. Uh, my name is Claire Haley. I'm the Vice President of Public Relations and Programs for Atlanta History Center. It is my honor to welcome you on behalf of our organization. Uh, before I go any further, um, the reports of the murders of civilians are coming to light uh, following the Russian retreat this weekend are absolutely horrifying. And so we want to pause to acknowledge and express our deepest condolences to all Ukrainians who have been affected by this tragedy and who have suffered because of it and because of this war. Millions of people have been impacted, including thousands who have lost their lives and millions more forced from their homes. Uh, becoming separated for their loved ones or have otherwise had their lives, homes, and communities really turned upside down. Um, but as the war started by Russia under the leadership of Vladimir Putin continues, uh, we're grateful to have this small opportunity um, to host a discussion and examine some of the history and current international political context um, under my, or undergirding all of this. Our hope is that by doing so, we can contribute our very small part to the kind of engagement and understanding needed from those outside of Ukraine in order to confront this enormous challenge. Our moderator today, who's going to be leading us through that conversation is Ricky Bevington. She's a longtime television and radio journalist and current president of the World Affairs Council of Atlanta. In addition to her work in the US with several organizations over the years, including PBS NewsHour, Georgia Public Broadcasting and NPR, um, she actually reported from Ukraine during President Zelensky's election um, and has uh, reported from Europe on several other occasions besides that. Um, and her work has earned her numerous awards and honors. And she will introduce our panelists to you this afternoon. Uh, know that as the event progresses, we do have the audience Q&A option open, so you're welcome to submit your questions into there. Please keep them brief and to the point if you can, so we can get to them as, as many of them as time will allow. I have a feeling we won't be able to get to all of them, but we're just going to do our best. So thank you again for joining us for this, this very important discussion, and I'm going to turn it over to Ricky to introduce our panelists and begin the conversation. Thank you so much, Claire, and thanks to everyone for taking time out today to join us for this very important conversation, Conflict in Context, War in Ukraine, a panel discussion with three exceptional experts from the University of Georgia, each and every one of them. I will introduce them very briefly. You can find complete bios of each panelist at atlantahistorycenter.com. Yulia Kabina is a, Yulia Kavina is a Fulbright scholar from Cherkasy National University in Cherkasy in central Ukraine. She's currently working on her postgraduate degree in literary theory. Yulia, thank you for being here. Thank you, Ricky, so much for invitation. Joey Kellner teaches Russian and Soviet history. He was previously a lecturer in Russian and global history at the University of California at Berkeley. Joey, we are glad you could join us today. Thank you, Ricky. And Andrew Oziak is a Josiah Meggs Distinguished Teaching Professor and Professor of International Affairs in the Department of International Affairs. He serves as the book editor for International Studies Review a journal of the International Studies Association. Andy, good to see you. Thank you, Ricky. Thanks for having me here. And a reminder to our audience before we go to questions, just uh, use the Q&A function to ask your question. Please be brief. We have a lot of ground to cover, as Claire mentioned. And we're going to start with painting a picture from the ground. Yulia, you are in Athens, Georgia, but you are from Ukraine. You're hearing from friends and family, I'm sure, throughout the day. Let's just talk about information sources. What sources of information do Ukrainians use to get updates about the war situation that they're living through? Yeah, uh, I'm keeping in touch with my family and close friends, and um, I'm pretty happy to get the information firsthand, so to say. Uh, most Ukrainians uh, listen to radio and TV and they uh, get updates on war um, progression uh, using Telegram messaging service. It's uh, the most um, convenient way to get new information because uh, many people have to move around the city, find air raid shelters, so they have all the information they need in their phones. Uh, 
And I'm so happy to know that um, my family and close friends are safe because they live in central Ukraine, which is moderately safe from all the bombing and all the horrific things that are happening in the east and the south of the country and in the north. And I can share from my own experience, I'm also getting some messages on WhatsApp and Signal and Telegram. And the information that Ukrainians are sharing is very powerful. It's very powerful images. There are documents, like living documents that can be updated of human rights abuses. So they are taking an active participation in reporting and being firsthand witnesses to everything that's happening. So uh, one of more many reasons to support Ukrainians and really applaud their resistance to this. About evacuation, how do they feel about having to be forced from their homes? Uh, you know, many people uh, from the temporary occupied territories have fled to western parts of Ukraine and the central parts. And it is absolutely terrifying for them to leave their homes, leave everything they, uh, they have been working on and uh, creating, just leave everything behind and go through these, um, trying to get to the train stations because that's uh, um, very dangerous per se because the uh, invaders are trying to um, shoot them down. So not everybody is making it to even to the train station. So psychological traumas for all the Ukrainians who are trying to get to safety are just immeasurable. But uh, I'm happy that uh, most of them uh, actually uh, find their safe places. And my, um, my city hosts many of the refugees and uh, people at my university in Cherkasy are taking care of uh, the people who have left their houses, who have nowhere to live, so they are safe and all their needs are met. So this is really nice. And but for still the some, yeah, excuse me. Still, some uh, some people do not uh, do not dare to leave their houses. And well, that was what I was going to ask you. For those who are deciding to stay, I would imagine it's a combination of many reasons. But what are you hearing from those who are staying, your family included? Yeah, those who stay are uh, just trying to protect their homes from the uh, invaders, from the marauding people, and uh, they want to stay where they are. Some of them have no means to uh, to, to to leave. For, for example, some people are uh, disabled or they are really um, difficult to transport. So these people prefer to stay. This is, uh, of course, uh, very, uh, very frustrating. And um, our, um, our military and our volunteers really try to evacuate everyone, uh, as many people as possible. Julia, a couple of weeks ago, the World Affairs Council of Atlanta interviewed a member of the Territorial Defense which is unique to Ukraine, maybe you can help our audience understand that it's not only the Ukrainian army or military broadly that's fighting um, Ukraine, you have Russian forces. There are thousands and thousands of Ukrainian civilians who have joined the, the territorial defense really units of their region. This was set in place by the Ukrainian government in January in anticipation of this. Can you explain to us how this is working and really just describe what it's like to see everyday people joining in the fight against Russian forces? Frankly speaking, um, I'm not very um, uh, proficient in this field. And uh, but still I know a person who joined the, um, uh, this territory defense team uh, he, he is a real patriot, I think, and uh, it's a really difficult decision. But, um, to, to, uh, but when the 
question is that you either protect your own territory, protect your family, protect your own people, or uh, what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. So this is just out of the question. So many people feel that they need to uh, take weapon in their own hands to be able to protect their family. Because in um, during peaceful times, that is something you never think of, right? No. So every, everything is chill, mellow. Everybody's going to work, living their own lives, having families. But this, um, I, I think this uh, critical situation uh, shows um, real side of the person. Right. Well, I think we can all imagine if, if the U.S. or Georgia were invaded, let's just say, trying to make apples to apples, would we take up arms? You know, would we, what would we do? Or would we flee? I mean, and everybody has to make that calculation for themselves. But it's certainly something that if we really pause to think about it, it, it impacts all of us. We, if we would ever have to make that decision, which I can't imagine, especially we've seen photos of, of men who are choosing to stay and fight, having to separate from their wives and children, which it's just like, devastating every time we see those images, um, the videos and the photos. I can't imagine this, what those families are going to. Let's go back um, to just the history of these two countries. Um, Joey, can you just bring us up to speed on why Ukraine's borders are the way they are and how this country kind of came to be drawn? Joey, I will invite you to turn on yes. your microphone. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Uh, Ukraine has a fairly long history as a nationality, Ukrainians do, but, but a very short history of, of its own statehood. And so the, the current shape of Ukraine as an independent country is a result of Soviet policy, really from the 1920s onward. Uh, and those borders, as we see them today, are they've been drawn and redrawn. They were expanded to the West after World War II. Uh, the Crimea, for instance, was given to Ukraine or transferred during the Soviet period from the Russian um, Republic. And so these borders in, in a state that is uh, has a very limited history of statehood are, are not drawn very well. Uh, from the perspective of a nation state. So you have a lot of different groups and a lot of it is, is fairly arbitrary. Uh, part of this conflict is defined by the fact that the Eastern regions, for instance, have populations that, that might feel more kinship to Russia or at least have historically. Uh, but I wanna qualify that and say that, you know, nations are not eternal. They're created in history by historical events. Uh, for instance, we're seeing a lot of people who are Russian speaking, who identified more closely with Russia right now, recognizing their Ukrainian identity and, and realizing that in response to Russia's assault, uh, the nature of the Ukrainian nation is, is shifting um, and they know which side they're on now. And so one implication of this is that uh, although these borders are very new and the Ukrainian state is very new, uh, Ukraine is certainly not eternally part of Russia. And especially after these events, it's difficult to imagine that it will be part of Russia um, in the future. And any historian knows that identity, how, how someone or their community feels about who they are is not determined necessarily by a border on a map. Identity is much broader. Sure, or by language or by location and all of that is, is very fluid. And yet, um, as we can sort of broadly say, Putin has decided what the identity is of, of the Ukrainian state and the Ukrainian people. How do we make sense of his recent um, historical speeches and writings? And maybe you could also just bring us up to speed on some of the things, we'll just say the claims he's been making. Right. And what's the history of that? So in recent months and in the run up to the war and continuing through the war, Vladimir Putin has been giving sort of these historical lectures, speeches, he even published a so-called article about Ukrainian and Russian history. And essentially the, the common thread in all of these is to deny Ukrainian statehood and to suggest that Ukraine and Russia are 
one people that they are one historical um, polity. Uh, this is, I would say, an extreme Russian nationalist position that seems to have moved to the center of Putin's thinking. It was not always at the center of his thinking. Uh, it has no real basis in historical reality. I mean, in, in one sense, Russia and Ukraine do have a common historical origin, but as I said, nations don't form in sort of the myths of medieval history. Uh, they form in the present and, and, from, and from current events. And so this, these historical justifications, and they really seem to be the primary justification, are more about the current echo chamber in Russia, the cloistered nature of Putin's administration, uh, the people that he surrounds himself with, and, and the way the Russian media have become uh, completely uncritical about the claims of, of the state, uh, where we can make that distinction at all. And so in the historical sense, these claims are, are fairly absurd, but it's clear that Putin himself seems to believe them. We should take them seriously in that sense, insofar as they're, they're obviously affecting the government's policy. Yulia, can you, I know you can't speak for 44 million Ukrainians, but why don't you share with us your, from your perspective, the Ukrainian, what is the U Ukrainian identity vis-a-vis -vis Russia? Because it's not black and white. It's, it has been very difficult to define Ukrainian identity throughout the years. And thanks to the um, difficult history of tearing our country apart between the Polish invaders and Russian Federation. And um, during Soviet times, our um, nation tried to survive, but um, the regime was against it and uh, the, they were trying to silence all the uh, Ukrainian speaking people. The uh, masterful writers and poets were just mm -hmm. uh, executed in, uh, with firing scores, which is absolutely horrifying. So I think that uh, despite all these uh, attempts, Ukrainian identity still survives. And it is, uh, it is not, it shouldn't be confused with Russian identity. We are different people. And um, of course the uh, language question is a very difficult one because um, many people in Ukraine speak Russian. So I'm from central Ukraine. I speak both Ukrainian and Russian. I'm bilingual since birth, just like many other people in central Ukraine, in Eastern Ukraine, but we identify ourselves as Ukrainians. So this is our country, this is our nation. And um, what, he, what Putin is trying to do now is just uh, turning uh, turning the concepts upside down and trying to manipulate them. Sure, because so many people in the world define identity by language. But yeah. you know, the Swiss speak French, German, Italian. It doesn't make them part of France, Germany, or Italy. That's a, a different complicated uh, borders drawn uh, because of wars. But uh, it's uh, as we're trying to discuss in this conversation, identity is far more than a border on a map. It's even far more than language. It's, it's nuanced and we could have an entire zoom on that. I'd love to bring in Andy now for some political and international affairs analysis. We were hearing NATO, 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 NATO. More Americans are talking about NATO than probably ever before. Um, let's talk about NATO just Bring us up to speed, and Joe, Joey, I know you have comments on this as well. How did this war start? Yeah, so I think you know one of the things that um, I think NATO plays a role in this. Um, since 1995, NATO has been expanding eastward, um, and I think you know from what I can tell, Russia has long been questioning the purpose of the alliance. It was formed originally to combat. Uh, the Russian threat. When that disappeared, I think Russia sort of thought that NATO's purpose had fallen by the wayside and so that it was going to perhaps disappear or transform. It wanted to be part of a larger security apparatus in which it had an equal role. 
And when it was clear that NATO would continue and that Russia wouldn't have that equal role, um, Russia wasn't really sure what NATO was going to do. And as it continued to expand eastward and incorporate more post-Soviet states, I really do think that, that Putin sort of wonders, are we still the target? Um, and then on top of that, he's watched NATO intervene in Bosnia, Kosovo, Libya, Iraq, and remove anti-Western leaders. And so if he sees himself as perhaps the target of this alliance and sees the alliance's role throughout the region and, and the, the world as removing leaders that the West doesn't like, he, he may feel particularly threatened by, by NATO expansion. And it's notable that um, NATO reaffirmed its statement to make Ukraine or that Ukraine would be a member of, of NATO uh, last summer. Um, and that was a statement they had made back in 2008, right before the Georgia campaign kicked off. And so th this is something that I think Russia has demonstrated an extreme sensitivity to. You, we talk about NATO expansion, uh, but can we go back to the beginning and you can share and Joey, I know you want to weigh in on, on the what you would argue would be a failure of, of NATO expansion. Um, what was the original NATO? And what do you mean by expansion? What exact? I wish we had a map actually you could draw it, you could show it, but help us visualize original NATO and then expansion NATO. Sure. J Joey, do you wanna do you wanna jump in or go ahead? Go ahead. So the, the original NATO is is formed in 1949 as a as a counter to what, what the United States and Western leaders, uh, France, Germany, Belgium, Canada, the United States, saw as um, a, a, a growing communist threat in Europe. As it, so, and it sort of stabilized in membership, including most of Western Europe. After the Cold War ended, it started to pick up additional members like Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, uh, expanded outward to Poland, it started to express uh, an interest in taking Georgia and Ukraine on board. And, and so what I mean by that is that its original purpose was to combat Soviet threat. And then it, after the Soviet threat disappeared, it started to move eastward towards Russia's borders and incorporate many post-Soviet states so that it would essentially be right up to the Russian homeland border. And that's that's kind of what I, I guess I mean by original NATO and then expanded NATO. But uh, Joey may have more by way of history to to incorporate here. I sort of focus on the politics side. Sure. And Joey, you can you can weigh in on that and talk about, you know, how this post-war security architecture, you've argued, has failed. Sure. Uh, and Andy's absolutely right that you know, the purpose of NATO was was to contain the Soviets. And I think it's important also to stress that the, the logic of NATO and the mutual defense clause is that it is a, a nuclear alliance and it is a nuclear tripwire. So the idea being that should Russia, the Soviet Union, um, transgress a border into any NATO country that that can trigger a, a nuclear war. And so the stakes are impossibly high. And, and Andy's right that the Russians protested NATO expansion uh, from the get-go there were other options on the table, and this decision was made to, uh, in effect, instead of ending the Cold War, to take the Iron Curtain and to move it to the east. And so the curtain itself is the danger. And in that sense, I, I think the Russians have a very legitimate claim, and they've been making this since before the Putin era. So the Yeltsin administration made these same protests. Now, the question then becomes, what does Ukraine have to do with it? Because Ukraine was in no way responsible for NATO expansion. And here, you know, I think it's important, Russia holds up NATO as one major justification of this war. But the moral leap from NATO expansion to this war is, is really enormous. And the responsibility is so clearly with the Russian government. Uh, what I've been saying to my students and in other panels is, is that there's an analogy here with the Versailles Treaty uh, after World War I. And we all know this is sort of a punitive piece and it's held up as producing tensions that then uh, produce conditions for Nazism to rise in Germany. Right? Joey, I'm going to ask you to briefly summarize. I think many of us in the audience do know the Versailles Treaty. And sure, absolutely. I mean, in, in brief, case, yeah. following World War I, the guilt for the war was placed entirely on Germany 
and there were very severe uh, reparations payments demanded of Germans, demilitarization, uh, and a curtailing of, of German territory. And all of that together fed very, very directly into the ideology of Nazism and into Nazi claims for the, the sort of revanchist and aggressive claims. Uh, and so that treaty was a punitive piece and we look at it historically as a failure, uh, but we don't equate the drafters of that treaty with the Nazis themselves. And, and so the difference between those who made these decisions with NATO, which I, I do think are catastrophically bad decisions, unwise decisions, um, and the Russian government now at war is still enormous difference. And, and the Ukrainians, not even to mention Ukraine, which has no role in the process at all. Uh, so I do think NATO expansion is a big part of the story here, um, but not exactly in the way that the Russian government believes. Mm -hmm. Andy, can the West and NATO do more with this context? You know, it's like, let's get through this crisis first and then we'll review and obviously a lot will follow. But in this context right now, can NATO do more? So there's a there's an easy answer and a, a more difficult answer, right? The, I think the easy answer is that the West and, and NATO could do more, absolutely, but it's highly unlikely. Um, I, I think the real chance to do something was to stand up tougher to Russia in 2014 when we had the Crimean crisis the first time. Uh, Russia learned from that about U.S. appetites for defending Ukraine and NATO appetites at the time. I think US, the U.S. doesn't really want a direct military confrontation with Russia. And we're seeing that in how they've enacted sanctions uh, against the, the Putin regime, even though we know from research that sanctions typically do not often work in getting the target to change their behavior. Um, and then I think, you know, setting aside whether it should be, Ukraine is not a member of, of NATO. And, and this is an unfortunate, uh, unfortunate reality here. Um, the defensive alliance commitments that come with NATO are about its vital interests, and that's going to require the alliance to draw a line somewhere. And anything beyond that line, the alliance is essentially saying isn't part of our vital interest. And so whether we like it or not, from, from the alliance's perspective, Ukraine at this moment in time is not part of the alliance's commitments and is not part of its, its structure. Uh, so I really, I really do think that it's the West could do more. And I think that in many ways, the West perhaps should do more. Um, but the political realities, I think, are pointing towards the US not and NATO not really having an appetite for doing so, unfortunately. And I'm going to bring Yulia in in a moment to get the Ukrainian perspective on NATO and slash the West doing more. But first, I want to ask a really broad question that has no answer and may be pushing, pushing the envelope a little bit. Does the fact that all of these decisions are being just made in the context of NATO, is that preventing broader, more innovative thinking about this? Like if, if the only reason to help Ukraine is if it serves NATO, is NATO the problem? And the, U, the US might have helped otherwise, but because it's got this NATO you know, threshold, it can't. Like, is this sort of keeping the U.S. or another any other nation in the world from saying we're going to get involved here? Uh, if I can, uh, it's a really interesting question, and and you're right that part of the problem with NATO and with the the Iron Curtain idea is that it's really binary. It's there's not a lot of room between uh, a local conflict and a nuclear war, and that's why NATO is so cautious. Um, and that was sort of the logic of the peace in the Cold War. Uh, on the other hand, to say that it's the problem is NATO, you know, unfortunately, the historical record is before NATO, you know, if we look at 1938, as the Nazis are beginning to expand, the, the record isn't great, you know, when the Nazis expand into Czechoslovakia, nobody comes to their aid, and, and, and there's just not an appetite um, among most countries to initiate a war with a, a very powerful adversary. Uh, when there isn't a vital interest or, or some immediate uh, political need. And so uh, I, absolutely, we all would like to see a more effective response from the West. We are all horrified by what's happening um, in Ukraine, but it is difficult to figure out NATO or not NATO, uh, what a response would look like that wouldn't be a, a massive escalation. And just sort of to, to add on to that, I think, 
I think there are other justifications one could use for intervention. We could talk about uh, protecting democracy. We could talk about human rights. We could talk about guaranteeing sovereignty. And yet each of those justifications over time um, has received support by way of intervention and not support by way of intervention. There are certainly times where the US has decided that human rights violations weren't worth an intervention. And so I don't know, I don't know if those justifications would help move forward assistance for Ukraine in this particular case. And I think that's just an inconsistency in US policy over time. We've got some great questions coming in and Please use the Q&A function if you have a question for any of our experts. If you'd like to specify which expert you'd like to direct your question to, go ahead. I ask you to be brief so that we can I can at least formulate the question in a comprehensible manner. I'd like to bring Yulia in, who again is our Ukrainian representative. I'd love to just ask you to respond to both of the perspectives we've heard from Joey and Andy. And what would a what would Ukrainians say other than I mean, I'm just going to put words in your mouth. Ukrainians would like more intervention, but expand on that. Uh, you know, it's difficult for me to talk about these things because I've never been interested in politics that much. And um, I was more into um, arts, liberal arts thing. Um, and I cannot speak for... Um, any Ukrainians I can share my own perspective on things. Yes, that's um, all we're asking. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I see now, uh, what Putin is doing now is uh, violating all the laws uh, of international war laws, uh, any logical and normal things. And I, my, my, uh, I think that uh, this the creative approach to doing things and invading other countries needs some creative solution. Um, you know, it's something that got really got out of hand and this is absolutely extraordinary thing what he is doing now. So um, I guess some uh, really extraordinary solutions should be the answer, but this is like, a um, very general um, point of view from a person who is uh, into literature and art and stuff. But Yulia, you like millions of Ukrainians are just regular people who, who are not trying to get involved in international policy. They're just trying to live their lives. And so the essence of your opinion is, is just as important as the policy makers. Yeah, thank you. And I would like to add that many um, Ukrainians say that uh, yes, NATO should do more and the sky should be closed, but um, uh, at what cost that would happen? So that means that other, um, um, other countries should place their weapons on our territory to prevent uh, Russian missiles coming and bombing our cities. So this is something that is a really serious step. This is something that many countries are considering whether it is worth doing or not. And what will be, what consequences will be of this decision? So uh, this is a really, a really tough question and I, I don't know what, what else to say. Mm, sure. I'm going to take a pause and get to some audience questions. Uh, I will plan, assuming we have time, to ask um, about uh, the role of nuclear weapons and predictions for how this all ends. But let's just pause and have some audience questions on some of the topics we've already covered. Um, we have a role from Jagdeep Sheth, who is actually a board member of the World Affairs Council of Atlanta. Thanks for joining us, Jag. Jag asks, what role India can play to mediate between Russia and Ukraine? Who would like that? Looking at you, Andy. <laughs> I mean, so, so I understand this, India and maybe any other large nuclear power. Yeah, I, I think... I, I think ultimately, and this will start to get towards how I think we get out of this particular conflict, because I think that's the purpose of mediation generally. Mm -hmm. um, I think there is a role for other 
either regional powers or nuclear powers to play, particularly non-Western ones, because of the conflict that is Western Russian at the moment. Um, the key to any mediation, though, in my view, is going to be trying to find a way for Putin to save face. Um, I think that this has been a particularly bad operation from a Russian perspective. And I think those in the security apparatus and those around him who have access to good information know that that's the case. And so for him to sort of maintain his strength as a leader, which will be important to him, he's going to have to find a way to be able to declare some sort of victory domestically. And I, I think if a mediator could find that formula, whatever it is, there would be a very big role to play. Thank you. Um, and again, we're, I'm going to circle back to, to the role of nuclear weapons and potential for nuclear conflict in a minute. But let's just um, touch on more back on Ukrainian identity. Um, we have a question from Kathy King who asked, does religion play a part in Putin's perspective? Uh, I can speak very briefly on this. Uh, the religious question is very complicated in, in Ukraine. The, Ukraine has quite a diversity of, uh, of faiths and of variants of orthodoxy, um, those who align with the Russian Orthodox Church and those who are in a autocephalous Ukrainian church, there are Catholics, there's, there's all, the, the religious picture is very complex and, and the Russian state, at least in, in the mind of Putin is very closely identified with the Russian Orthodox church. Um, but in this conflict and in the way that he's spoken about this history, um, I think that the religious dimension sort of conflicts within the church are, um, are epiphenomenal. They are, they are a consequence of the larger questions of statehood and of geopolitics. Um, I don't think that there's at heart of this uh, a religious conflict at all. And I can just jump in and say when I was in Ukraine in 2019, I got a meeting with former President Viktor Yushchenko, um, who was very much involved in the early 2000s during the Maidan revolution. You all may remember pictures of him being severely poisoned and his face turning black. He wears very heavy um, makeup and his kind of project um, is to dis has been to really fight for the independence of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. Yulia, you may be able to weigh in on this from a Ukrainian's perspective. Do you see him and other leaders out there in the effort to to divide, I don't wanna say divide, but to at least carve out a unique identity in the Ukrainian national, Ukrainian Orthodox Church specifically? Yeah, I think that a uh, really uh, important step for Ukrainian nation has been breaking away with the um, Russian Orthodox uh, Church and uh, claiming our own Orthodox Church, Ukrainian one, uh, which really um, which really discouraged and uh, um, uh, made many people in Russia angry at this because uh, but, but but I don't I, I don't I don't understand why <laughs> because um, religion has never been uh, uh, one of the major issues um, between Ukrainian and Russian people. So it has always been territory and language and uh, politics, not religion itself. Well, I think that that goes to our conversation about what are the main sort of themes of Ukrainian identity versus Russian identity. So we've touched on language, we've touched on borders, we've touched on religion. What other distinguishing I mean, other than obviously the system of government, what other, Yulia, you know, larger themes, it could be food, it could be other things about people's sense of identity in Ukraine that you think are distinct from Russia. It could be dress, it, obviously it's history. Why don't you share some of those with us? Yeah, we share many similar uh, things uh, in cultural um, aspects like food and um, clothes, 
and stuff. But I think the most distinguishing feature is uh, values, mm. because Ukrainian folks uh, are, um, are protective of what they have, and they do not. Um, this is uh, not in our character to go and try to invade other countries. We are living in our place and trying to make it flourish and prosper. And when, when it comes to protecting our homes, well, we have to be brutal in protecting our, our families and our nation. So I guess this is one of the most distinctive feature in character. I, I, I never, uh, I never thought of this before before war started, because uh, I've always loved my people, loved my country, and uh, the nature is absolutely amazing. And I, I really loved my country, but I have never thought of. Uh, what is really distinctive for us. But now I start to think about it. And uh, in a way, I'm very, very thankful to Mr. Putin for making me do this and uh, making all the people of Ukraine unite and stand tall for the greater good. Mm -hmm. Well, that's certainly, speaking of President Yushchenko, he said that um, before the invasion of Crimea in 2014, you know, the resistance to Russia was younger, higher educated, based, you know, focused in Kyiv. And then after that invasion, a lot more Ukrainians really got on board, like they were forced to decide and forced to pick sides. Maybe, Andy, you can weigh in on that about how more broadly, when, when invasion happens or such a conflict, people, they choose sides and what role that plays in this conflict, but also Ukraine's future relationship with Russia. I mean, absolutely. I think, you know, our research, my research is particularly related to territorial issues and the outbreak of war. And you know, what we find repeatedly in our discipline is that territorial disagreements are more likely to escalate to war than any other issue. Um, so this particular case is, is interesting to us for that reason. Um, it's one of the few major territorial conflicts involving a major state since the end of World War II. Um, it, it's in some sense, odd um, because it's reopening the territorial status quo. So we know that typically when countries draw borders between themselves and they agree on the placement of those borders, whether that was internally, administratively, as Russia and Ukraine might have done internally um, or externally with its neighboring countries, those borders tend to remain pretty sticky. Um, and the system doesn't really allow, the international community doesn't allow you to change those unilaterally with force. So I, I really think that, um, you know, this is a case where, and one of the reasons I would like to see a stronger response by the West is because I do think that this is a case where we are really deciding whether or not to redraw the maps of the world. I mean, other countries are looking at this and deciding, do these dangerous issues merit more attention? And as you noted, and as Yulia noted, you know, one of the reasons that they're so dangerous is because when you start attacking someone's homeland, people naturally become defensive. We see it happen in the United States with mm -hmm. people's personal property. Uh, we see it happen then, of course, at a nation state level when people feel like their country is being invaded. They, they have this visceral defensive response. Absolutely. And I think if I may add, Ukrainians are looking at, back to Yulia's point, values. What set of values do they want to live under um, do they want to live under at least the best version of democracy? Hopefully Ukraine has been able to achieve so far. Um, it's no democracy is perfect. Um, but Zelensky clearly has widespread support and he did win the, his election in 2019 with widespread, um, support. 
Um, we just have really not a ton of time left and we've got a lot of great questions, but I'd like to bring in the role of Poland here um, because, and so Poland and then actually Hungary is now being an outlier among European nations or EU nations because Hungarian um, uh, uh, president, um, actually I think he's prime minister, Viktor Orban, correct my, with his title, I can't remember there. Is he president or prime minister? Anyway, Viktor Orban just won re-election leading uh, Hungary. He was, a, I think he and his Fidesz party took over in 2010. Um, let me bring you in Joey to just talk about the role of Poland um, and then vis-a-vis -vis Hungary. Sure. Uh, it's been really remarkable to watch uh, what's happened in, in Poland since this war began. Uh, and Yulia spoke of this briefly, you know, Poland and Ukraine have a very long history of conflict. Uh, those borders have shifted many times. Peoples have moved in mass. Uh, we're talking hundreds of years of, of sorting out the border of, of Ukraine and Poland. And on a level of sort of individual dispositions, resentments, they're not uh, two peoples that have historically gotten along or, or did until very recently. But this is really a remarkable testament to Poland's transformation uh, the, and historical change generally that Poland has rallied to Ukraine's side. <clears throat> uh, it's the culmination of a very long reconciliation process. And Poland right now is shouldering an enormous uh, refugee burden, uh, very disproportionate to other states in the EU um, and doing so with, with great honor so far, not perfectly, and there are growing conflicts and tensions, and we can expect those to continue to grow. Uh, Poland will need help, absolutely. But it's remarkable because Poland's government, like you said, has been drifting in the other direction. Poland has, becoming, has become increasingly undemocratic since the fall of the Berlin Wall, as Hungary has. And here, I think we're seeing the limits of that, uh, the limits of their hostility to Europe, the rec recognition of a shared, if we want to say shared values with Europe and uh, alarm at, at the Russian threat here. And so, so in Poland, as in Hungary, uh, we've seen, I think, a surprising amount of unity with those countries and the EU. Uh, the limits are greater in Hungary. Hungary has gone further down this sort of backsliding path than Poland has. Uh, and we shouldn't get too comfortable with it because, again, these, the refugee crisis is going to be a long-term problem. But in the immediate sense, it is really remarkable to see that Poland uh, has, has taken on such a burden and seems to be um, united behind Ukraine to the extent it can be. Back to the uh, conversation about when something really intense happens, people are forced to choose sides. So Poland yeah. has chosen its side. Hungary has chosen a, a, a trying to walk the line in a much more fine way. Talk about the Fidesz party's response to this. Sure, I'll speak briefly. I, it, it may be that, that yeah. he knows better. And specifically, I think it matters to our audience in the context of Hungary being an EU nation, it's an outlier in its response. Yeah, yeah. Hungary has been resistant to heavy sanctions. Uh, Orban has been very historically close with Putin um, and has in a lot of ways modeled himself on Putin. And so that Hungary has joined sanctions at all, I thought was remarkable. But especially now having been reelected, being more secure in power, I would not count on uh, continuing cooperation from Fidesz and from, from the Orban government. Uh, Hungary is a, a real problem in that sense, that the, the democratic backsliding is much more complete than it is in Poland. Um, and so, I, Andy, if you have expertise in this, in this question, go ahead, but that's just my briefest impression. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'll leave it there so we can keep going. I think you've done it. You, you answered it very well. Sure. I think that uh, Orban's reelection, I agree, and they have veto power, uh, right. which will which will matter uh, as this continues. We're going to talk about um, the role of nuclear power, and then I'm going to ask our panelists to talk about um, how this ends. Uh, so let's go to a question. Let me find it here. Um, 
Cheryl Roll asks, how high would you rate the current and foreseeable risks of a wider European conflict and Putin using tactical nuclear weapons? Andy, why don't we start with you here? So, to, I mean, to me, given the way that NATO has proceeded very cautiously here, I think that the likelihood of a wider European war is, is very limited at the moment. Um, as far as nuclear weapons, I think they probably would, would play and do play a very limited role here. The, the threat is something I certainly think we need to take seriously. Uh, and I know that Putin has threatened the West with nuclear weapons if they intervene and, and those kinds of things. But typically, leaders don't want to rule over land that has suffered a nuclear attack. So if in getting, if, if in getting Ukraine back for Russia, Putin has to use tactical nuclear weapons that destroy part of that, that land, and then he gets, there's really no value in that. So we think that typically leaders are using nuclear weapons to bargain and to uh, bolster their negotiating position rather than for the pursuit of something like in this case, taking nuclear weapon or taking territory. There might be some exceptions to that. So irrational leaders, and here, I mean, um, not, not leaders we disagree with, but leaders who are, who are not able to cognitively make cost benefit calculations. Um, and then, you know, if Putin finds himself in an existential situation, like he thinks that he's going to be thrown from office imminently, then he might perhaps use nuclear weapons as a way to um, sort of go out on top or try to try to save himself. Um, but again, typically, I think these are, are about bolstering bargaining power or deterring major other states from, from intervening. Joey, why don't you weigh in from a historical perspective? This is the first round here in Europe. Um, in the nuclear age since World War II. Yeah, it's the, the historical data are, are fairly limited. Um, I'll, and, and so I, I can speak a little bit about Russian nuclear doctrine and, and that's, it's not necessarily a historical perspective, but I think Andy's by and large right. I, I don't think Russia has even really threatened to use nuclear weapons. It is, I think more of a signaling and, and a bargaining um, tactic. Uh, now Russia, has a nuclear doctrine that basically states that Russia can use these weapons if there is an existential threat to the Russian state. And so one of the worries is that as things go badly for Russia, uh, we should certainly not take heart necessarily because it, it does risk some kind of escalation in, in a sense. It also appears that there needs to be a decision by both the president and I either the Minister of Defense or the Chief of the General Staff. So unlike in the United States, when it really rests with the president entirely, Russia has a more diffuse decision-making process, which may be a good thing. Uh, in terms of the historical precedent, we have the Cuban Missile Crisis as being, you know, by far the, the closest we've come to a, a nuclear conflict. But at that point, the sort of automated, um, mutually assured destructive system of nuclear weapons wasn't really fully established and or, or it we're dealing in very different circumstances right now and and so i don't think there is a lot of precedent i think that regardless of how detached from reality the putin government has become there probably is a, a fairly deep-seated understanding of the stakes of these things and uh, at a pretty deep level in the russian government um and so you know i'm not taking any extra measures in my personal life. But I think that it is alarming, certainly. And, and it, there's a reason that this topic keeps coming up. It's a dangerous situation. Well, it was asked earlier about the role of, of India playing a part. And Edward Shartar has a question for Andy. What is the cost and benefit calculus to China supporting Putin? Yeah, I mean, I think China's walking a really fine line here. I, I think, you know, they, they don't want to sour relations with the West, but at the same time, Russia and China are in, in almost a similar situation in that they would like aspects of the status quo, particularly the territorial status quo, if we're thinking about the South China Sea, to change. And if Russia has found a way to adjust the territorial status quo in its favor, China would certainly like to do something similar with respect to Taiwan or with its borders out, out in the South China Sea. So I think 
I think it's being very cautious. Obviously, it's very sensitive to violations of sovereignty, so it doesn't want to support too much because it'll look like it's supporting Ukraine in its typical position. But it also likes the idea that we can push the boundaries of the current status quo in a way that might be favorable to states that have gained power. And that that's why, why I think it's walking that line at the moment. It's trying to have both sides. Sure. Well, to be continued, and we could do a whole other hour on China and Taiwan and analysis of how this might influence activity um, in that part of the world. Um, we're going to go a few minutes over time for those who are counting down the minutes on your lunch break. I want to ask each of you um, to share just your thoughts on how and will this ends, uh, how and whether excuse me, how and when this ends. Um, obviously, we all want it to end at this moment and do, for us all get to a news thing on our phone saying it's over. Um, and specifically, Yulia, I will ask you from the Ukrainian perspective to include in your answer what Ukrainians do next from your perspective. So I'll just go left to right on my screen. Well, let me go, Andy, um, Joseph, Andy, and then Yulia, you can wrap us up. Joey, go ahead. Sure. Uh, predictions are difficult and historians in particular, I think are not very good at them. I'm, I'm not going to predict other than to say that I would temper any um, great expectation. You know, things are not going well as Russia plans, but We've seen conflicts similar to this one go on for 10 years. Uh, we were in Vietnam for 10 years. And, and so th there's no, um, you know, we might be in very early days. Uh, in terms of how it actually ends, I, I would only add that, again, taking the example of, of Germany that I, I raised earlier, the Versailles Treaty. Now, after World War II, there was a much more reasonable and um, accommodating peace in a sense. And Germany is now part of Europe. Germany is integrated very well into a peaceful order. And I think it's really important um, to learn from NATO expansion and to recognize that, that Russia too can be part of a peaceful order in the future. Russia has changed many times. It, it will change again. This regime will pass. Uh, this conflict will pass, it, it will end. And so to, on the day it does, be ready to think about an order that can integrate Russia um, and that can avoid uh, cyclical violence in this part of the world, I think should be a, a shared goal. And so that's something um, that I can, to, in some measured way, um, hope for. Andy? I'll, I'll echo that predictions are difficult and you know certainly we deal with probabilities in, in my field. And I, I think there might be two ways that this ends. A, a very small probability event would be that Putin is removed from power, either internally or externally. Um, I don't think that's very likely, but if the war continued to go bad and uh, those in the security service and others in the, that are keeping him in power were to turn on him, that would be one potential way to get a policy change. The second way that I alluded to earlier with respect to mediation was that Putin needs a way to back down and somehow claim victory to save to save face. That's the more likely route. Um, but the challenge, of course, is that, you know, U.S. President Biden's recent comments complicate that a little bit when when he talks about removing Putin from power, whether that was the official U.S. policy or not. It feeds the narrative that Putin is under siege, that the West is out to attack Russia. And so I think then what you get is a, a domestic audience. Um, so everybody within Russia, the leadership and the citizens that rally around Putin as a way to support him and give him more strength as he tries to pursue this war even longer. So I think that perhaps hurt a little bit, but ultimately I think there needs to be an exit and, I, I, and that's really gonna be a way for Putin to save face. I just don't know what that looks like yet. Well, we should add that just as many others are picking sides, Russians are picking sides as well. Uh, and I didn't get to some great questions about how Russians are reacting and responding to this, what the public opinion is. So I'll just ask Yulia, let's dream a little bit. Um, what are Ukrainians going to do next? This will end, as Joey said. What's next for you in Ukraine? 
think uh, after the war ends, we will win and freedom and democracy will be our um, trademarks of our country again, because freedom is something that is written on our coat of arms and it's intrinsic in our nature. So we will rebuild everything that has been destroyed. And uh, I really hope that um, people who are responsible for the war crimes, for killing, torturing civilians, for raping Ukrainian women and doing other ghastly things in our country will, will be punished. And uh, I'm, I'm really glad that everything is being documented. As you said earlier, common people just take pictures, record videos. So everything has been documented and uh, everything has gone public. So there is no way to silence these atrocities. I, I really hope this, um, this will end soon, but yeah, coming back to earth, coming to being more realistic, I think we just need to accumulate more power to fight, fight the Russians off and finally win. Thanks to each of you, Yulia Kabina, Joey Kellner, and Andy Asiak. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Ricky. And uh, I will, um, I'm Ricky Bevington, president of the World Affairs Council of Atlanta. I'm happy to hand it back to Claire Haley, Haley of the Atlanta History Center. If she wants to say any wrap ups, I will just add uh, the World Affairs Council of Atlanta is doing some great programming, both in person and virtual, and feel free to sign up for our newsletter at wacatlanta.org. Claire, back to you. Thank you so much, Ricky. I'm putting the link in the chat here so everyone can get to y'all's website because y'all have such a great roster of programs. But thank you, Ricky, and thank you to all of our panelists today for providing so much needed context. Um, the hour flew by, um, so started many more conversations, I'm sure, um, at home for everyone too. So again, uh, to our audience, thank you for joining us. Thank you to all of our panelists. And uh, we hope that we will not see you back here in a similar situation in the future, but um, that you will find this helpful and continue to engage in this issue as we uh, see how it progresses. So thank you again, everyone, and have a wonderful rest of your afternoon.